is an honor to introduce Dr. Rosie Davis, a professor of counseling psychology at the University of Memphis, where she has worked for more than 30 years. Previous roles include serving as the Vice President for Student Affairs, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Student Development, and Director of the Center for Student Development. She is also the past president of the American Psychological Association. Davis's scholarship has focused on the power of inclusion, multicultural vocational psychology, ethics, and living well in a diverse society. She has served on the editorial boards of several journals, including currently on the Journal of Career Assessment. She is the author of numerous articles and book chapters on career counseling and has co-edited two books. Her keynote address today highlights inspiring innovation. Welcome, Rosie. Well, thank you. I, I am delighted to be here with you today. And I want to give a special shout out to uh, Dr. Kathy Evans, president of NCDA, because she has shepherded a wonderful conference. And I know what a big change it is to be president in a year when it goes exactly different from what you expected. And all the technicians who've helped us with this virtual conference. And then a special shout out to uh, Ms. Mary Ann Powell, who has been the person with whom I have spoken every time. And even today, when I was not doing everything I needed to to get on, I just thank you all for that. And now what I'm going to do, I took as my topic, inspiring uh, in innovation, promoting social justice, increasing diversity in career practice, which was the conference thing. Then I just added, a colon and added creating spaces for all voices. What I want to do is begin with you by sharing four stories. Some of them are direct quotes from stories I found on the internet and one I put together myself. What I want you to do though is to imagine that each of these people were born on the same day and yet their lives were so different. So each was born on November 27th. Okay, let's see. Okay. Katie was born on November 27th. She was the eighth of 12 children. She was born in Memphis, Tennessee, about a year after the family escaped from a plantation in Mississippi. The family lived in a four-room shotgun house. And the picture on the screen looks like a shotgun house. And what happens with a shotgun house, for those of you who aren't from the South, if you stand in the front door and shot a gun, the bullet would travel straight out the back door without touching any walls. It was a small house where the first room was the living room. It was about 10 by 10. The next room belonged to her mother, Matilda and her father, Jake. Then came the bedroom where all of the children slept. Of course, that means they slept together in beds. And finally, the kitchen with a little tiny bathroom attached. And at some points in their lives, before they got a washing machine, they all bathed in a little tin tub, same tub that they rinsed their clothes in. For a while, Ophelia had the mom, her mom, all to herself. She had mom for five years, and they were quite a team. But then Madea went on to have some more children, and Kelia ended up having to defend for herself. Poverty sometimes robs mothers and fathers of the ability to fight for their children, to stand up to the very institutions that are supposed to do right by them. So what happens when a little girl in third grade needs a mom to stand up for her? By the time Kelly was in third grade, she was having a hard time. She was sometimes called white girl by her siblings and other children because her skin was a bit lighter for a long time. Her brothers and sisters would sometimes say, you ain't not our sister and you ain't the same. She often cried and prayed to be dark skinned like Katrina who lived down the street. She had a teacher who didn't like her. Under Madea's oversight, Kelia would diligently do her homework and get all her spelling done. 
the next day when Kelia took her chance, the teacher didn't even check the little girl's work. She just wrote F on her paper. Kelia wondered why Madea wouldn't come up to the school to defend her. But how do you get up the nerve to defend your little girl when you have been called girl all your life on the plantation and on your job cleaning the homes of your white woman master? Madea couldn't go to the school. At the end of the year, when Kelia failed third grade, Madea finally went to school. But it was too late. How do we do career counseling with a little girl like Kelia, and how do we bring her mom into the picture? Which of our theories will work for her, and which interventions take her ethnicity into account? Michael. Michael was born on a reservation. One day he walked in the classroom with his hoodie over his head, dejected and down and out, and the teacher wondered what was wrong. Michael lived in an overcrowded multi generational home. His house stands in a remote rural housing district on a gravel road with a dozen or so other homes. There are many factors leading to the remoteness of Michael's community. Few in the community have cars, and, and if they do, the reliability of those cars is limited as few. There is one road in and out. The distance from town is 10 miles. The nearest school is 30 miles, either north or south. This community lacks young resolution is mainly made up of relatives of one stand family. Home Michael have two three rooms. This seems okay for an average family. And there are around twenty five hundred residents on the reservation, which roughly means that there are two hundred and twenty homes available. So that means that on average each home houses twelve or more people with families doubling and tripling up in order to have shelter. However, because most people cannot afford to build their own homes, many tribes have a massive housing shortage problem with a housing waitlist system. The list is long with as many as 70 or 80 people on the list for housing at a time. So that means that people often wait seven to eight years for a house. On the Creek Reservation where Michael lives, there are upwards of three to 400 homeless people. So for this reason, most Native people live with their extended families in small homes while they wait for their own home. Joseph Shields, director of the Creek, Pro Creek Housing Authority, said overcrowding, substandard dwellings, and lack of utilities all increase the potential health risks, especially in rural and remote areas where there is a lack of accessible health care. Michael's mom is poor and cannot adequately feed her family. Michael worries about his siblings. And so which theories and which interventions will I use to help Michael? Is there room for his voice? How do we create space for Michael's voice? Kenia yeah. was born on November 27. She looked at her mother looking out from a migrant encampment near one of Tijuana's main border crossings. Her mom said she could almost see San Diego, the shimmering American city, just beyond the frontier fence. She could see American cars as they slid down a highway and disappeared toward a ghostly skyline. And she could imagine what lay almost within reach. But that promised land was also infinitely distant. From the Mexican side of the border, mired in inches of mud that reeked of broken portable toilets, the entire United States might as well have been a mirage. Mom added the family's name to the bottom of a list in a thick book. There were more than 5,000 migrants ahead of them waiting to request asylum in the U.S. because of recent changes in policies. American authorities were only processing between 40 and 100 requests a day. 
So uh, Tania's parents expected it would take months before their names were called, but they were willing to do whatever it took. Going back to Guatemala was simply not an option as the lives of their children had been threatened. All told, more than 159,000 migrants filed for asylum in 2018. That is a 274% increase over 2008. And so, which of our theories, our interventions, make space for Kenil's voice? Kayan Song was born on November 27th, and she wrote this essay. Our voices need to be heard in the garden. I became interested in art because of a friend from school. Not only did I influence my older siblings and mom into taking art classes, but I also got to participate in a Photoshopping class last summer. I learned how to put objects into a picture and change the lighting to make it look natural and convincing. And my teacher asked me to do it over two or three times to get it perfect. I had so much fun that I dreamed of a career in graphic design at one of my favorite companies, Disney. I watched interview clips with Disney's graphic designers before movies at the theater, but I was curious. Where are all of them? Well, white. I wonder, does Disney choose their top designers based on race? This reminded me of my middle school elective class called Leadership, where we set up most of the school's events, such as dances, a variety rally quad. Although 50% of our student body is Asian and 52% is white, our leadership class is equally split in race. I noticed the older white students made most of the decisions and assigned our roles without asking for the opinions of the younger Asian American students. Even though I joined the leadership to help plan events and have fun, being ignored or not participating as an equal made me feel disengaged. I imagine working at Disney having the same issues where I wouldn't be able to get as many opportunities as others. I learned about the Asian American stereotype of the model minority, that we were seen as smart and hardworking, but socially awkward and submissive. And she goes on. But I wonder what theory or intervention would I use? Is there room for this Korean voice? I've talked for years about the role that career educators, teachers, researchers, most especially practitioners, can play in the larger society, especially when turbulence happen, like wars and acts of nature, like hurricanes, illnesses, poverty. I spent the last two years thinking about and having the American Psychological Association focus on deep poverty. When I look at the stories above, I see that poverty rolls through most of the stories. I can see that poverty, for some reason, seems to always have a grip on this country and others and just won't let go. Last year, in the United States, we had the lowest unemployment numbers we've seen in decades. But even those numbers did not talk about the people who, had, who, who no longer looked for work or who were working in jobs where they were severely underemployed. Those numbers said nothing about what was going on with people all around the world. As I've read and learned about poverty, especially deep poverty, the numbers leave me continuing to find so many things unacceptable. And I continue to wonder, when are we going to understand that my neighbor's problems are my problems? When will we create space for all of those around us? I don't like that around the world, there are 200 million people who work wonderful. It's unacceptable that in this day and age, a country as rich as the United States has nearly 40 million people unemployed, or 40 million living in poverty and such. 
and 46% of those live in deep poverty. Over 12% of people in the United States live in poverty. In the United States in 2018 ranked 35th out of 41 of the wealthiest countries in the world with the number of children living in poverty. I find that unacceptable. I don't like it. I don't like it that nearly a billion people around the world live on $2 or under a day. And I don't like it that 75% of the people living in poverty are women and children. It is unacceptable to me that when people's lives are severely disrupted by tragedy, tragedies like tsunamis and hurricanes and nuclear meltdown, it takes years for people to find work. And sometimes those people will never work again. I didn't like it that after the hurricane, 3,000 people in Puerto Rico died and Virgin Islands took hundreds of babies to get clean drinking water. I don't like it. The water situation that is in Flint, Michigan, that still has not been re resolved. And I don't like it that these circumstances force so many more people into poverty. So I ask you to take a moment to say, can we do better? I worry about poverty, especially extreme poverty. And poverty has a definition uh, in the United States. And it's that the United States Census determines poverty status by comparing pre-tax income, pre-tax income against a threshold that is three times the cost of a minimum who died in 1963 and is updated annually for, in, for inflation by the Consumer Price Index. So when we look at poverty, it varies a little bit. But a family of four, two adults and two children living on about two hours. And I think it does not matter whether that's in New York or Memphis, where I live, either places, it's still the same. So actually, some people living in poverty in, a, in an area that is not as high cost as in California, they still may be a bit better off. But nevertheless, that's how it is. And so imagine that, that you get to live on $25,000 a year for two adults, two children. That means you're making about $12.50 a year. Now, I got really interested in this because I am an NPR junkie. And so I donate to National Public Radio all the time because I listen all the time. And I was listening uh, in 2016 to uh, a story on poverty mythbusters. And they talked about the research that was done by Chetty and Hendren. And they were looking at pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And what they found was that in the United States, if you were in the bottom quintile, your chances anywhere in the United States were moving to the top quintile about 12.9% in uh, San Jose, California. And then they mentioned Memphis, Tennessee, where your chances were 3%. And that's when I realized I'm a miracle, and my husband is a miracle. In Tennessee, we rank near the bottom in poverty when we compare ourselves to the other 49 states. And if you look at poverty by uh, race and ethnicity, you look at the cost of the United States, it rarely varies from the numbers that you see on the screen. And you can see that I believe these numbers are from 2017. They don't vary all that much in terms of how the individuals rank. Sometimes, depending on the state, you will see some differences with Native American Alaska Natives. You will see some differences, but not all that much. It's, it's always that race and ethnicity it's, a, it's impacted. It shows up the same. And a lot of that is a part of what people are talking about when they talk about systemic racism. Now, when I actually looked at the numbers for my state, I had this fantasy that Knoxville, Tennessee, I hope that some of you know about Knoxville, Tennessee, because that's where the University of Tennessee is. And that is where the volunteers play in this big stadium that holds at least 100,000 people. And it is packed every football Saturday. Be different this year, of course. But 
is packed. And I thought that they were wealthy. And then when I looked at the poverty rate, it shocked me that the whites in that area had a poverty rate that began to resemble the black rate in other parts of the state. And I wonder what in the world happens in a place where we don't even take care of our most prized race of people. How come we don't have room for all of these people in our theories? And, and I just hate to think about all the children who are hungry. Remember I said that 75% of the people living in poverty are women and children. And in my state, one in five children struggle with hunger. In my county, 39% of children live in poverty, and 40% of them live in households where the parents earn under $10,000 a year. Is there a space in our career series and our interventions for the voices of children who are hungry? Is there space for the 6 million seniors? go to bed hungry every night. Now, the only theory that I really know that just so distinctly addresses adults is super theory, and he talks about disengagement, but I am sure he was not talking about disengagement from even the ability to have food on the table. Do we have room for the voices of those hungry seniors in our theories? It is a fact that a college education will help to improve one's uh, one economic condition. And yet, as we prepare individuals for college, we see that there are problems early on. There can be as much as a 26-point reading gap by fourth grade between low-income and wealthier students. And we know that we see more of that disparity in public schools, that more low-income children are going to public schools, and it grows. So, for example, when we look at that in, in 2000, there were only four states where half the children were low-income. And look at what happened by 2011 and by 2013, and it just goes up from that. In my state, low-income students, more than almost 60% are from low-income families. I, I wonder why is that? And how do these children manage in the face of the kind of poverty that they live with? Maybe there's space in the elementary grades for career interventions for students who are not reading on grade level. What do we do there? What kinds of programs are there in public schools for children that take into account their race, their ethnicity, their gender, their social class? Poor communities are more likely to have crimes of all types. So why is crime contained in poor communities? Well, it happens there, I think, a lot because of poverty. Now, when my son was young, I, even though I probably could have afforded to send him to private school, but since I'm a citizen and I pay my taxes, I want him to go to public school. So when he went from sixth grade to seventh grade, the school atmosphere changed. At his school, he didn't have to write in person, and he didn't have to write with a ballpoint pen. He wrote with, with a pencil. So he was doing his homework at home, but still I was getting things that he's not doing well at school. I went to his school and found out what was going on, and none of the teachers were doing anything. At first, I couldn't even meet with them until I called all of his teachers and his principal together to meet with me because I decided, mm -mm, this mom is going to do something. And actually, I told them, you will either deal with my son now or you will deal with him when he's coming through your window to rob you. And interestingly enough, when I was preparing these remarks for you, I thought of another thing that happened with him. Uh, since he wanted to be an actor, I thought, well, he should take accounting or something so he can learn how to be a business person. Well, they asked me, I got a call from, from one of the administrators, and they said, well, can we 
take your son out of accounting because he's mediocre and we need the space for someone else. And I agree. Even I didn't stand up for him to have space. And I let them give his space to someone else. And that was his career that I was thinking about at that time. And yet, when you think back to my mom and how she grew up, or the mom in the story and how she grew up, they couldn't even go and fight for their dreams. So who will be there to fight for their spaces to make sure that their voices are heard? Poverty is linked to poor health. Over 1 million people are affected by poverty. There were nearly a million deaths from tuberculosis, something that we can have an immunization from. Poor people are at 50% greater risk for heart disease. And when people are ill, businesses suffer because of lost productivity. I bet business people would like us to do something different with our career intervention and would like us to create more spaces for individuals who are poor because it affects their bottom line. I bet you that our career counselors who are out there practicing would like it more if we impacted poverty because that means more clients for them because poor people can't pay to see counselors. Poor people must often choose between putting food on the table, shelter over their head, or taking a sick child to the doctor. I'll tell you another story, and it's because I do have a poor family. But one of my brothers, I had lost his job. And what I discovered, because the family only keeps important secrets, I guess, really important secrets, I discovered that what he was doing was not buying his medicine for his diabetes because he was feeding his child, who was two years old at the time. When I discovered it, I said, oh, no, we've got to do something about that because you won't be alive to have that child grow up. And so he was crippling her child, his child and crippling himself. Luckily for me, I had some extra money that I could share that money with him. It's that scarcity makes us make poor decisions. And so we can see it best. Uh, some of the research on farmers, that they make different decisions during planting season versus harvesting. And so scarcity, just people wonder, why do you make those kinds of decisions? Because scarcity makes us make poor decisions, just like my brother, poor decisions. There are, when I, when I looked at this information, it was death from despair. On this slide, it lets us know that the mortality rates for whites with no more than a high school degree was around 30% lower than the mortality rates of blacks in 1999, and it grew to be 30% higher than blacks in 2015. Why? Those manufacturing jobs that went away. It was the indentation into the blue-collar aristocracy. And yet, what do we as career counselors, how could we have helped those individuals? to turn their lives around? How do we make spaces for people's voices who were there, but then get shut aside? So, poor people struggle. Here's what Eric Jensen says that before three, this is what um, a child needs to grow up strong and healthy, a strong, reliable primary caregiver, a safe and predictable, stable environment. And this is one that struck me, 10 to 20 hours of harmonious reciprocal interactions. And I wonder, if you're working two to three jobs, just trying to feed, clothe, and provide shelter, where do you find those 10 to 20 hours for that harmonious and reciprocal interaction? How do parents provide these things? How do they have the emotional energy or the economic resources to provide them? I, I don't know. Sometimes we think that people who live in the countryside are better off than if you rule, but one of the things that we often think 
of poverty and we immediately associate it with black people when I've asked people about this. But they don't think about the fact that in the countryside, you might see a little small home with 500 square feet that has blue tarp on it and the faces are white. And their situations are desolate. Oftentimes, there are limited services, food insecurity, lack of health care. There are a million children in this country who don't live anywhere near a local pediatrician. And here's what the urban and rural poverty rates are. And you can see that the rural poverty rate is different. You know, it's interesting when we look at COVID, too, we had this fantasy that it was not going to get over to those rural areas. And yet, they did. And the hard thing about it is that when we look at the coal mining jobs that people hope will come back, they aren't coming back. So what do career counselors, career educators, career, research, career researchers do about that? How do we intervene and do any of the things that we need to do? So poverty impacts every single one of us. So what do we need to do? I like what Laura Smith, she's a psychologist at Columbia in New York, and she does a lot of work on poverty. And she believes that therapists must begin to understand the oppression of the poor in a multicultural social justice context. She says that we've got to begin to understand the dynamics at every level because oppression and power go together. And then she says we must begin to produce transformative action. She says that we need to do participatory action research. In other words, we've got to use the people with whom we want to do the research. They've got to become our community scientists. They've got to be a part of the research that we do. And so, you know, I reflect on things like um, Holland and uh, the developmental theorists and uh, the victors and the constructivists and social cognitive and say, do we do any of that with any of those theories? Do we do any of that? Seems like to me that they, they've been mainly aimed at the middle class, although we've come to know better. I find that uh, I looked, I read recently <clears throat> David Bluefin's book on, on working. I liked it because David's book had all kind of people in it, and he told stories about uh, working class people from different races, ethnicities, trans, all of that. And Bluestein and his colleagues say that we have got to be more active and we need to take a more social justice vision. And so their, their theory has some appeal to me. Now, I do wish feel that even in David's writing, that he had more voices writing with him who were different. And maybe he does just on, on this particular book. So then we, 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 we're dealing with that. And then here comes COVID-19. That makes me wonder, and so then what do we do? How do we manage it? When we look at what happened, look at unemployment. In 2019, we were at 3.6%. Even at the beginning of 2020, and then we're now over 11%. The number of people unemployed in February was 6.2, and by May, up to 20.5, and we keep going up and down. Now, I do like it that the government did an intervention that helped those individuals so that they weren't into deep poverty, many of them. And yet, what is going to happen if we don't continue that? See, what had already begun to happen, according to Bryce Covert, since the reception, the top 100% of the U.S. captured 91% of the real income. Now, that's just unacceptable. How do we spread that out? And here is the other interesting thing. When we talk about how this system of poverty is baked into 
the very system that we have here. When we look at, this was data that I collected uh, by July 4th when I looked at the CDC information. And when we look at cases per uh, 100,000 and who's leading the pack, non-Hispanic, American, and I don't need American, American, but non-Hispanic, American, American Indian. Well, you can fix that when you look at your slides. Or 221 per 100,000. Blacks, 178 per 100,000. Latinx, 161 almost. And then when you look at white, 40. What is so different about that? Why is it that our population looks like that? According to the American uh, Progress, members of the Navajo Nation who have the largest percent of the virus of any group in the country, Native people make up one-tenth of the population in New Mexico, but 65% of the coronavirus cases. And then just look at, yeah, Shelby County. You know, I always like to talk about Raleigh. And this is data as of July 2nd. It's changed now because we're surging like many other places. But when you look at the cases and look at the deaths, where 61% are black, there is something wrong when we have situations like this. And then they got worse, then it was George Floyd. And what happens to us when we have this kind of trauma? Counselors, look at what happened the week after that video was shown. The spike in anxiety and depression for Black and Asian Americans. In that one week, from 31% to 41% among Black, 28% to 34%. And look how many people that was affected. 1.4 million African Americans, 800,000 Asian Americans. How do we find space for these forces? How do we collaborate more? How do we pull these things in? Because the COVID-19 so racism all impact what is happening to our economy. So what I say is that we've got to collaborate more. We've got to win. Even when I looked at my syllabus for my career class, I realized that I didn't have enough diverse forces on my reading list. <laughs> I didn't have enough. I've got to do better. Got to include more multicultural variables. And I thought I was doing a good job. But when I asked the question, am I creating enough spaces? The answer came up a little short. I do want you to see that when I created some instruments when we were both doing therapy back in counseling centers. And we created the Multicultural Career Counseling check, uh, Checklist. And you can find that in the Journal of Career Assessment. That was done in 1993, or you can write to me out, send it to you, even though one of the things is when you put it in the book, if you don't copyright it, it's no longer good. But nevertheless, we want a counselor to be able to look at them and say, okay, am I prepared? Do I know the right assessments to use? And then am I working with the client to decide on what we actually are doing? Then we also wanted the clients to have a career counseling checklist so that we can understand what they were thinking about themselves. So I feel I'm the only one who does not have a career plan. And I bet you will find some differences for people who even know about thinking about that. I lack knowledge about myself and what I have to offer the world of work. Create that and do that for yourself. We did it. We did it. You can do that. And, and then what is your theory? How does career counseling work for you? Well, here's what I did. So, and this you can find in writings with Nadia Fouad and Swanson and Fouad's career counseling book where they use case examples. But here, how do, how do people make career decisions? I thought, well, you're born with something, so there's some biological fact, factors. I don't know what those are, and I don't know how to measure. I do know that we began to form things about boys and girls very early. We start saying blue for boys and pink for girls, but we start very early. And then we get messages from the family to tell us something about what we're going to be when we grow up, if they talk about it. And then our subgroups. In this instance, I was talking about race and ethnicity, but you could put any subgroup in there. I suspect for trans individuals, that influences some of what's going to happen with them. And then there's the dominant society and what it is. And I thought that was pretty cool. 
Exhale. I had a big miss. As you can see, as I've talked about all of these things, what happens here, and this is why I say a big miss, that we in our research and our writing too often don't include information about class. So that means that we don't know what's happening with large segments of our population and how poverty is impacting the decisions that we make about careers. So APA did a whole push on stop skipping class. You can look at some of that at APA.org and you can look at the work on deep poverty that we did. So that fight was bringing psychologists psychologists to the fight against deep poverty because we find that people have anti poverty, people like to blame people in poverty. And so there are some some different ways that we all can make a difference in our work on poverty. Here's an example of something we did in our community right here in Memphis. We decided to do something called Vision 2020. And this was one of the which is an organization that I joined at back in 1990, when they said, Rose, do you want to do something to help women and girls reach their full potential? I said, sure, I do. I thought I'd be doing service training. Turns out I was raising money to help support programs that help women reach economic self-sufficiency. So we picked four zip code in Memphis Street 126 and the poverty rate and, this, and set some goals. And one of the goals that I like right away was number two, to help with multiple job skills that enable residents to gain living wage employment. You see, what we do, what you do in the world of career makes a difference in the entire world. And so we've worked with the residents and asked about what they needed. We use evidence-based intervention. And after two years, were striking already. More people with jobs, more children enrolled in child care. People beginning to buy homes, a 20% increase in household income. Now, the household income was only a little over $8,000 a year, but still a 20%. And then two years later, a 49% increase in household income. And it's even more than that now. The last figures I looked at went from $8,000 to $18,000 a year. So a part of doing the work means doing the work in the community. So I challenge you to add more voices. And when I say add more voices, that means creating spaces for the voices that you don't think about. And I know it's a lot to ask, but nevertheless, we must. I also mean collaborating with more people who are different than you. Do you even have friends who are of different race of ethnicity than you? And when you begin to at least reach out like that, you begin to see people in a more human way. I ask you to create an activist social justice agenda. When we look at and say, why social justice agenda? Because so much is baked into the way things are. You know, one of the things about the Civil Rights Act of 1968, it was designed to make our own government Stop having policies that would not allow black folks to buy homes. And so we created poor neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods here, wealthy ones there. Rework the inventions in our theories that we have, make sure you do some research. And then I just say, listen to something bigger than you. Because I know that all of us wanted to do a great job. That is why we chose the work that we chose. You can change things. You don't have to be a world's number one scholar, but we do have to give it thought and we have to be intentional in our actions. And with that, I think that's the end of my slides. And we are open for a few minutes worth of questions. I think I left about 10 minutes maybe so that we can have some questions if you'd like to ask some questions. And I can't see the chat. So. If you guys have questions for Rosie, you can type those into the chat section and I can read those off for you. Here's one from Tracy. How can we get access to your checklist? Okay, so you, you, Tracy, I love that question. 
what I forgot to do when we submitted that uh, as part of a chapter was to copyright it. So all of you young writers out there, anything that you create, remember to copyright it. So, but you can get it from uh, the Journal of Career Assessment, 1993, um, or actually if you email me at rbingham at memphis.edu, I'll send you a copy. You have to give credit. So. And, and the other thing that I'll, I'll say is that we created it in 1993, and you will see that even some of the wording, like we talked about cross-cultural counseling, now they talk about multicultural counseling, we all talk about multicultural. And so, but, but you'll see how we did it because it was important to know that. So what I can suggest to you is that I'll, I'm happy for you to look at and then modify and don't be afraid to create for yourself because you can. Here's another question. What are some of the challenges you see with mostly immigrants coming from civil, civil war conflicts trying to transition into higher ed? Oh, yeah. And so uh, a lot of times, it, it depends on where people are coming from. And so you, you already know that there, there may be some, some poverty issues. We may have some language issues, uh, and we may have some PTSD issues. Uh, we may have some issues with family. And so I, I think you won't find that it's the same for everyone, but you are going to find probably, uh, especially coming from a country where there's been a lot of war, or even if it isn't war, like the story of, uh, of the uh, immigrants from Guatemala, sometimes it's not that they were in a war, but sometimes they're leaving a situation that was especially dangerous uh, to the individuals here. And so we're going to have some problems there. You're going to have problems with people not knowing how to engage with the system. And right now, I mean, those were real facts about how people just can't even get, they can't even get to, um, to have their to have their day in court to, when they're seeking asylum. So we have a lot. We have separation of uh, children. Now, of course, your question was the transition into higher ed. So some of those people have already overcome some of those problems. But when they are, uh, one of the things that I found, even with some of the students in my career class in graduate school, is that sometimes they still were dealing with what what were the parental expectations for them. What were their cultural expectations for them? And of course, we always did. If it, if, if it wasn't English, we, then we do English as a second language. So we we did. We're pretty good about that. There are going to be some money issues with the transition. So that's the ones that you can imagine and, and expect. They will all be there. Remember to take them as individuals. So never use anything as a monolith because we want the general. Theory. We want the general outline. We want the general views that we have to help shape what we think. But then we want to know when the person is dealing with an individual. Here's another question that comes from Julie. Can you speak to the elements in your own career that helped you move forward in spite of where you are from? And thank you for that question, because one of the things that I, I want you all to know is that I'm a garbage man's daughter, born in Mississippi. I'm born in Mississippi, grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. And so my, my father was a part of that I am a man group when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came here and was killed in 1968. And if you're young enough and don't know what that is, go and read about it, because it's, it's history that you ought to know. So for me, I was an early reader. I read everything, and I always tell people, read. It doesn't matter to me what you read as long as you read. And so there are people who will reinforce you for um, being smart. So be smart. But the other thing is just saying yes to things. I would say yes to things even if I didn't know that I could do them, and even if I was scared to death to do it. For example, the first time someone asked me how to write, asked me to write a book chapter, I had no idea how to write a book chapter. And so I, I said yes, and then I thought, now what? So I think saying yes and accepting opportunities, even though 
uh, you might not know what you're doing. I think some of the other things that, that happen is saying yes, and then if you do a good job, if you show up, if you do the best you can, if you push it and go on in spite of your fears, those are the things that were helpful to me. And because I find even though I face racism and sexism, I also always had somebody on my side. So there are always people out there who will root for you. And so look to those people and look a little less to the ones who are against you, except if they're saying something that you can use. Here's a question that comes from Eric. Do you think a lack of one strong central voice among various minority groups has hurt their message? A lack of one strong, uh, so would, would that question be about somebody like when Dr. Martin Luther King was speaker for the group? You may recall that Dr. King was mostly hated when he was the main speaker. I think he probably only had about a 30-some percent of approval rating. So no, I think what is more likely to hurt the cause is when all of us don't step out. And the other thing that I would say about that is that the thing that will make us all much more powerful is when each of us joins in so that if, if you think that there are not enough Native Americans speaking up for Native Americans, then you speak up. For Native Americans. One of the most profound things that I found when I was on the executive board for the for Division 17 of the American Psychological Association, we were trying to make a decision about designating one of the seats on the Council of Representatives for a person of color. And two white women spoke up and they said, I was the only person of color in the room. They said, Rosie, you shouldn't have to fight this battle. Let us fight it. And they of that battle. So if there's not a strong voice that you see, then you become a voice. We need allyship. See, there's not a group who will get any place all by itself. So I say it's part of the reason why I challenge you to create a social justice activist agenda and why and add your voice. So you be the strong voice. I you know Michael Moore is a strong voice for everybody. So he speaks up. So you be the strong voice. Here's a question from Allie. Who do you listen to, look to, read and engage with about social justice? Oh my goodness. Well, God, there's a lot of social justice there. Um, but I, I look to my family. I love that my family has everything in its poor, addiction has everything. And so I get to live and see my community. I read, uh, I have good friends who are uh, into social justice. You know, we started the National Multicultural Conference and Summit with my friends, uh, Daryl Wayne Sue and Neville Vasquez, Lisa Portia Burt. I have, I read, I've read Janet Helms. I told you about uh, reading David Bluestein. Um, oh gosh, there are so many, uh, Linda. Forest is outstanding. Um, did I say Jen and Helms is outstanding? And so um, I read, um, I was trying to think of the latest book I read. I just read The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health. So if someone re refers something to me, then I'll pick that up and, and read it or read an article. Now, to be honest with you, I don't really, really, really like to read a lot of uh, books. I like for people to read them and summarize them for me, but sometimes I'll go ahead and read them. Articles. Uh, there's some young, young uh, scientists who are coming along, too, that I think are great. Annalise Singh has a wonderful book out on, um, on working with racism. Thank you again, Dr. Davis, for that presentation.